Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'll begin. I have uh, just a brief disclosure. I work with uh, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals on the development of uh, tau imaging agents, but I won't be discussing them at all in the talk. And so I'll begin here. Um, I'll get into a lot of facts and figures about uh, cognitive impairment and dementia as we get older, uh, but we need to remember the individuals that are affected. So these are uh, self-portraits uh, painted by a gentleman, his name is at the lower corner, William Untermolen. And so his leitmotif, uh, he's an artist, and his leitmotif was self-portraiture, painting dozens and dozens of self-portraits through his life. Um, so this is a retrospective study. He eventually uh, became uh, afflicted with Alzheimer's disease and uh, descended into cognitive impairment and dementia. So here's a self-portrait as a young man, then uh, in 1967, then a bit older in 1995. The family reports that sometime in here, 1996, 1997, he began to show signs of impairment, what we would now uh, call as a diagnosis mild cognitive impairment. So difficulties with memory, uh, but not yet with activities of daily living, right? So difficulty thinking, not difficulty living yet. And uh, his disease progressed. He continued to sell, paint self-portraits. It's around here that he met the diagnostic threshold of dementia, which means he now, his, his difficulties with thinking are now so profound that he ha he'll have difficulties with basic activities of daily living. And then this is his last self-portrait in 2000. He died uh, two years after painting that image. And I think these are uh, haunting. Uh, they really draw forward the self-effacing nature of this disease. Uh, many of us, I'm sure, have witnessed this in our families. This is the reality for someone as they, as they live through it. So an individual view. Now, uh, a public health view. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, there's an organization in Seattle called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. It's supported by the Gates Foundation, run by Christopher Murray. And they have a absolutely jaw-droppingly um, interesting website. They, um, when the Gates Foundation decided to uh, try to intervene in health in the developing world through vaccination. That was their first step. The question was, uh, how do we know we've been effective? And in order to answer that question, you needed some measure of the burden of the illnesses that you were trying to uh, intervene with. Uh, that's what started this effort, and it's now blossomed where um, uh, Chris and his very large team have taken on the goal of measuring the burden of disease globally. So you can go and almost most nations in the world participate in this, and so you can go to their website, click on a nation, and all sorts of uh, data will begin to come forward. It's worth it if you have a, you know, an hour or two to spare. This is a screenshot from our first effort, a paper that uh, we published in The Lancet in 2012. This is a screenshot of that data for the United States. Okay. And the graph's a little complicated, so let me just orient you. So uh, along the horizontal, number one to number 25, that's the uh, number one cause of death in the United States to the 25th most common cause of death in the United States in the year 2010. And then on the y-axis is percent change in the uh, prevalence of that disease as cause of death um, between uh, 1995 and 2010, over the preceding 15-year period. So this is roughly uh, current and then change over the preceding 15 years. So the number one cause of death in the United States remains ischemic heart disease, but over the last 15 years we've made some success. It's becoming less common. It's still the most common, but it's less common. So we're having success in intervening in ischemic heart disease. Stroke also in the, is number two, um, and in the face of a progressively aging population, we have also had some success in reducing the burden of, oh, excuse me. Uh, 
I have to watch that pointer, in reducing uh, the burden of stroke. Um, I will just point out, because we've, we've heard a lot of discussion about brain tumors this morning, uh, uh, brain tumors is not even on this graph, right? So now, we, but we will talk about what are very common diseases. So first, Alzheimer's disease, number four cause of death in the United States. The carrot on the top of that bar means that it was literally off the chart. So in the preceding 15 years, as um, it prevalence in the population had grown more than 200%. Some of that may be case ascertainment. Almost all of it, though, is due to the, as I say, the progressive increase in the average age of our population. Next, I draw your attention to Parkinson's disease. It's number 24 on the list as cause of death. It's the second highest increase of, of all of those illnesses in the top 25. Falls is a close second to Parkinson's disease. Those, are, those two are very likely related one to another. Both of those affect brain health. Both of those can affect cognition. Parkinson's disease, of course, also has a motor component. I won't be talking about that. I expect that will be the focus of Dennis's uh, talk to follow. And the third threat to brain health is small vessel injury to brain the type of small vessel injury that occurs in kidney, heart, and eye. The end organ, the brain also is an end organ for that type of injury. And the, the major risk factors for that type of injury, they're more than that, they're really mechanistically related, are uh, diabetes and hypertension, especially the combination of insulin resistance and hypertension. So we're gonna focus on those three uh, illnesses moving forward. We estimated in uh, Seattle their population attributable risk, and that's a statistical estimate. It means if I could wave a magic wand and make uh, plaque and tangle disease disappear, make Alzheimer's disease disappear, how much dementia would disappear from the population? And the answer to, to that for Alzheimer's disease is about 45%. For small vessel injury to brain, it's about 30%, and for Lewy body disease, it's 15%. Now again, this is how much dementia would disappear. Um, others have uh, followed this in, in population-based studies around the United States, in Europe, and in Japan, and we all see roughly the same result. Uh, sometimes Alzheimer's disease will be as high as 55 or 60 percent, vascular injury might be a little bit lower, uh, down as low as 20 percent, but the pattern is the same. Alzheimer's disease is number one, apparently, threat to brain health as we get older, small vessel injury to brain number two, and at least as far as cognitive impairment is concerned, Lewy body disease is third. Another key concept to understand about these illnesses is that they're all chronic diseases, right? No one wakes up with dementia one morning. Uh, that's a disease that had been going on for years, if not decades uh, prior. That chronic diseases all have latency, meaning the disease has started before it's clinically apparent. So in these population-based studies, we tried to estimate what is the latency of these three uh, chronic diseases. And again, the data from Seattle is here. Now, what I'm calling Alzheimer's disease means uh, I, that we were able to identify um, uh, plaque and tangle disease beyond the, the usual that John was just describing. And these are individuals now who are in their 70s and 80s. So at that point in life, uh, virtually everyone, not everyone, but virtually everyone shows some evidence of latent Alzheimer's disease. Not, ev not everyone is cognitively impaired. This, is a, this disease is very, very common in the elderly, and it, it presents in a large fraction of people who are affected, but not everyone who's affected. Vascular brain injury of this small vessel type has a latency of about 30%, and then the type of Lewy body disease uh, that can be associated with cognitive impairment, so a more advanced form of Lewy body disease, um, uh, about 30%. It would be wrong for me to leave you with the impression that as we get older, our brains are threatened by Alzheimer's disease or vascular brain injury or Lewy body disease. Um, 
those are the three diseases, but they commonly converge in individuals. So uh, the, the reality of cognitive impairment and dementia in the elderly is that it's most commonly a convergent trait. Uh, I show, uh, for those that are not familiar, the, the uh, classic histopathologic features of these diseases. So in the upper corner is the plaque and tangle of Alzheimer's disease demonstrated with a silver stain, similar to what Alzheimer himself uh, did, basically using the chemistry of black and white photography to re reveal these lesions in tissue. The next image is a H and E stain of a, a neuron in the in the substantia nigra, and that large pink structure is perhaps the largest Lewy body I've ever seen. Um, and then down in the lower corner is a, a lower magnification uh, photomicrograph of one of these microinfarcts. So the, the lesions produced by small vessel injury to brain are, are called not very imaginatively microinfarcts, and the definition is not very imaginative either. They are lesions that look like this. They're too small for us to see by eye when we dissect the brain, and then in, we, we look for them in screening sections, and then we identify them mic microscopically. So um, these are data from the study in Seattle. Uh, I am um, a consultant neuropathologist to other uh, studies, so the 90 plus study, the Honolulu Asian American study, and the NUN study. And of those, uh, we see data like this for all of those studies. So this is, a, this is common, uh, a common distribution of uh, these diseases in the elderly. So everyone on this graph has dementia, all right? That's why the, on the x-axis. Every bar is a person who was diagnosed uh, with dementia. And then on the y-axis, the height of the bar is whether their Alzheimer's disease, which is in blue, was absent, so that you'd get scored zero, or mild, moderate, or severe. So not very sophisticated, but just a way of trying to demonstrate the level of the burden of these diseases in brain. So Alzheimer's disease is in blue, Lewy body disease is in green, and small vessel injury to brain is in red. And you can see that there are many people with dementia that have high levels of Alzheimer's disease and, and no other pathology, pathologic features that we were able to detect. But what's most common is some mixture of intermediate to high levels of Alzheimer's disease with intermediate to high levels of vascular brain injury with sort of Lewy body disease uh, being less common, isocortical Lewy body disease being less common and scattered about. This is an interesting graph. It goes back to what John was saying before. There's a lot of variability in these indices of uh, burden of disease in brain, these pathological indices that we use. They're common measures, and they have value. They may not be perfect, but they do have value. Uh, down in the, uh, near the abscissa on this uh, graph is an interesting group of individuals. They have very low burden of disease, yet they have dementia. So they are severely impaired individuals. Uh, because this was an autopsy study, we can speak with some confidence about what's not there. They don't have prion disease. They don't have frontotemporal dementia. In fact, they don't have a pathologic explanation of their uh, severe cognitive impairments. And just to underscore that, we've seen that in every group that we've looked in. In Hawaii, the nuns from Midwestern United States, our population in Seattle, Julie and her group, when they look in Chicago, we all see this somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of individuals in these population-based studies who are severely cognitively impaired don't have a pathological fingerprint. Right? We don't have an explanation. So it's a major question yet to be answered. So the same um, organization to this graph, but now everyone is a high performer. So not just simply um, not dementia, these are individuals who would be considered successfully aging because they're performing in the upper three quartiles of the cognitive screening test that was used in this population. Same organization now, right? Everyone on there is a high performer and they d decided, volunteered to donate their brains for research. So each bar is an individual. 
And you can see that it's the, the, these same diseases exist in, in the individuals in this age range who are not cognitively impaired. That's the latency of these diseases that I was describing earlier. So latency is common for all three of them. All three diseases are present. So it's not as though crossing the threshold to dementia means that you have Alzheimer's disease and now you add vascular brain injury and that's what pushes you over the threshold. That doesn't appear to be the case. All three d diseases are present during latency and what's associated with progression to dementia is having a greater burden of which one of these or group, which group of diseases that you happen to, to have. There are, again, the extremes of the graph are also very interesting. Um, down near the abscissa, um, it is uncommon, very uncommon to live to your 70s and 80s and have no evidence of any of these diseases in your brain. It exists, highly, highly successful aging. Those people exist, what, right? So what I, I wanna know what they have, because I want it. Uh, but we don't know the answer to that yet. There are many people that are interested in understanding that group. There's another very interesting group. If you look out to the other end of the graph, there are individuals with high burden of disease, at least how we measure it by uh, pathologic markers, there are individuals with high level, high burden of disease, as, as high as or higher than anyone who has dementia, yet they're not demented. And that's this group that's called resilient, uh, right? So high level of disease, but no clinical expression. There's a lot of interest now, um, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand what is the basis of resilience. What, what do they have that appears to be protecting them from expressing the high level of disease that by pathologic examination they have. So to summarize the points I've made uh, so far, uh, this is a diagram that was uh, uh, drawn by artists at the Wall Street Journal, so I, I can't draw. Oh, and I'm tone deaf, so I'm definitely not gonna sing. Uh, 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 so I credit them. They uh, were highlighting some of the work that uh, we were doing at, at the University of Washington at the time. As John was describing, what appears to be happening, oh, excuse me, so we'll talk first about Alzheimer's disease, plaque and tangle disease. Uh, what appears to be happening is that uh, tangles appear in the uh, structures of the medial temporal lobe in middle age. And this has been represented in the uh, neuropath literature going back to at least the 1990s, maybe earlier, and is now being validated by our colleagues who have uh, developed uh, tau imaging agents. What happens next is, just as John said, that there, there appears to be this a blossoming of uh, amyloid beta accumulation, which we're, at least for our purposes here, uh, measuring as plaque formation. That's out in, largely in, uh, in different regions of brain in the cerebral cortex. And then what follows later still, and is the most, is the closest correlate of, of progressing to dementia in Alzheimer's disease is that these same neurofibrillary tangles that previously were, were largely restricted to this part of the medial temporal lobe now spread out to isocortical uh, regions of brain. What happens with Lewy body disease, um, what's associated with the, the presentation of motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease is the, is the formation of Lewy body disease in uh, upper brainstem structures, uh, iconically in the substantia nigra and in the locus, but by the time they have formed there, they very commonly have formed in other regions of brain, in lower structures in the brainstem and in the olfactory bulb and even in other regions of the body, in salivary glands and, and gut, which is an intensely interesting uh, opportunity for uh, development of biomarkers. The, the mark of uh, progressing to cognitive impairment and dementia from Lewy body diseases when they also spread into um, uh, limbic and uh, cerebral cortical uh, structures. The last of these three diseases then are the microvascular, uh, the small vessel lesions to brain. Uh, these don't follow a typical progression, at least as far as we can tell, that uh, if you have the uh, risk factors for, for this type of injury to brain, it begins, tends to begin in your 60s and then uh, progresses and these lesions accumulate as best we can tell, not a, a, a strictly random frat fashion, but they are scattered throughout the uh, cerebral cortex. 
So in summary then, uh, dementia is an increasingly common global health threat. It's not just in the United States, it's as I showed you the graph for the United States. I should mention we published a follow-up to that work uh, this last spring uh, in The Lancet. Um, by, by calculations of Chris and his team, the reduction in burden in, on, in the globe for uh, HIV and AIDS uh, is exactly matched by the increase in burden for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So this is a threat to cognitive health in the United States, but also in regions of the world where typically we haven't thought about Alzheimer's disease as a serious problem. It is, a, it is not as common as it is here because people don't live as long as they live here. But as life expectancy increases, it is becoming, is increasing exponentially in uh, low-income nations. Importantly, dementia is an idiosyncratic, meaning it varies from individual to individual, an idiosyncratic convergent trait of three prevalent chronic diseases, each with prolonged latency. And uh, all those concepts are important in how we go forward in constructing, uh, appropriately constructing clinical trials to intervene um, and protect cognitive health. So it's a complicated problem, and uh, the approach that uh, we have, um, that we envision is most likely to be successful is this idea of precision health to bring clarity to this complexity. Um, you have heard this morning in, uh, for the examples from brain tumors, uh, what would be examples of uh, precision health or precision medicine. In fact, this concept has broadest currency in cancer care also in uh, cystic fibrosis, and I think that it really applies probably to all chronic illnesses and now being adapted to the management of cognit cognitive health. So, so from here to the, the remainder of the talk, focusing more on where I think the field will be going. So what does this mean, this idea of precision health for uh, diseases that affect cognitive health? So the first will be uh, to stratify by risk. Right now we know the most about genetic risk, and I'll go into that some but to stratify by risk into different bins. So this um, uh, mixed population at the top gets stratified into their different groups. And then key will be detecting latent disease. If the history of medicine teaches us anything, right, think about cancer care. Uh, waiting for individuals to present in the doctor's office and say something's wrong, or in the case of cognitive impairments, usually the spouse or significant other. But waiting to that point is too far down the road, right? That's how we used to do cancer care. And at that point, right, someone to show up and say, well, I've had a 20 pound weight loss in the last six months, right? That's just not how none of us expect we're going to have success in that scenario. But that's where mammography, screening mammography came from. It's where pap smears came from. PSA testing, now some of these have worked better than others. Screening colonoscopy, they all derive from that concept. These are diseases that develop over many years and the disease starts before you're aware of it and we need to detect the disease before you're aware of it to have maximal, effect, uh, maximal effectiveness when we intervene. So we, we need, I've shown you a lot of autopsy data, obviously that's at, at the very end of the, of the course of the disease. We need to develop other tools that can detect these three common diseases in their latent period and I'll show you an example of one of those. And once we've been able to stratify people by risk so that we can appropriately um, arrange their preclinical screening and we have the tools to detect these disease in their latency, the last step is to have disease modifying therapeutics and this is where, quite frankly, the, the field really struggles. Uh, there are many, many laboratories around the globe that are trying to develop these and I'll give you a brief overview of, of where we are but at, currently I think you can argue that we don't have any. So molecular drivers of Alzheimer's disease, um, there is a large consortium of investigators that span planet Earth uh, that uh, contribute to what's called IGAP. And I give you a reference from 2013. Um, uh, there are uh, disease-associated genetic loci that have been discovered since then, but this is an especially good review article at that time there were 22 genetic variants that were thought to modify your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, a group of us, and included several people in the room, um, uh, undertook a, a, a large uh, collaborative study to ask the question, so the, we have genetic variants associated with the 
likelihood of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, right? So a clinical diagnosis. How do those genetic variants match up to plaques or tangles, right? These two facets of the disease. And are some of these genetic variants driving one or the other or neither? That's really the question that we wanted to answer. Um, so uh, as part of this consortium, I said thank you to the many people in the room who contributed. Uh, we assembled an, uh, it would have to be an autopsy-based study of about 5,000 uh, brains. Um, and the, sh the short summary of that work is here. So the photomicrograph is the image I showed you earlier of plaque and tangle disease. And then in the callouts are the genes and what they were associated with. So we were able, this is a smaller study, right? So it's only 5,000 people. So the, we weren't able to confirm all of the genetic variants in our study, right? Because 70,000 or more individuals were needed to identify some of those loci. So we can't speak to all of the 22, but the 12 that, were, that we were able to verify are listed here. So and some of them are very, very well known. So APOE, of course, is the major genetic risk factor uh, for uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, ABCA7, BIN1, CAS4, and I won't read all of them. Uh, they were, uh, those genetic variants were, were significantly related to the accumulation of plaques and tangles, so both facets of the disease. If you move down to the uh, lower corner, the lower part of the graph, um, clusterin, SORL1, and then that mix of letters and numbers that I, I don't even know how to pronounce, uh, th they were uh, related exclusively to um, a tangle accumulation, not to plaque. A smaller list, MS4A6A and CD33 related to plaque, not tangle, right? So this begins to guide us in developing hypotheses about how these potential molecular drivers are related to the progression of disease. And what I think of all of this is intensely interesting is CR1. So CR1 has been many times replicated as a variance in CR1 as a, a risk factor for the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Those variants are not related to plaques or tangles. And if you think for a moment, there's more to the expression of disease than just injury and response to injury, which is what we think these pathologic features represent. Right, so there's injury, response to injury, and then dysfunction, which is offset by consumption of reserve or physiologic compensation. And when that's overcome, then there's expression of disease. So we speculate, so I have no evidence to back it up, that this, we should have expected this finding. And that we think CR1 is somehow related not to the injury and response to injury that underlies these pathologic features, but to compensation, or, uh, or consumption of reserve that underlies the ex clinical expression of the disease. If that's true, you could do the thought experiment. You would imagine if you had some sort of therapeutic <clears throat> that was uh, targeting CR1 and what it does, you would have individuals who are less burdened. They would, pre they would preserve their cognitive functions or less clinically burdened, but yet their brains would still accumulate plaques and tangles. As I mentioned, excuse me, it is rare for an individual to uh, live to their 70s and 80s and not develop uh, uh, multiple pathologies, not simply Alzheimer's disease. So we weren't powered to look at these comorbid lesions, but they were there. So uh, we did the analysis on them as well. So none, uh, sorry, and we did this by GWAS, not the candidate gene approach that we used for the IGAP loci. So by a genome-wide association, we could find no genetic variants related to the small vessel injury to brain. Uh, for uh, congophilic amyloid angiopathy, a very strong relationship to APOE, and that feels comfortable because we think APOE is related, APOE isoforms are related to the differential trafficking of uh, A-beta peptides. Interestingly, um, Lewy body disease uh, was associated with APOE, and I, I hasten to add that this is in the construct of individuals who had dementia. 
So we're not targeting the motor aspects of Lewy body disease. Our study isn't targeting that. It's the cognitive aspects of Lewy body disease. And we observe this association with APOE. And we and others have been able to replicate that in different contexts. So this appears to be true. And then just making it over uh, genome-wide significance is an interesting candidate uh, for hippocampal sclerosis, at least in the context of this study, uh, potassium-activated uh, calcium channel that's expressed in the pyramidal neurons of the hippocampus. So very, the, bio, the, the hit and the biology is intriguing when you think of the pathologic changes in hippocampal sclerosis. I don't know of anyone uh, despite my efforts with uh, reluctant fellows, I don't know anyone that's followed up on that finding yet. So a little bit about Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's disease in, in the context of an illness that can affect cognition, not its motor uh, component, which uh, uh, the focus of Dennis's talk is Parkinsonism. So uh, for your uh, benefit, uh, a reference, um, uh, from 2014, a review of 24 um, uh, genetic loci linked uh, to risk for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in our Udall Center, we have undertaken effort to try to find, it's okay, um, the genetic risk that underlies a cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. And then just to review for you briefly, uh, approximately uh, a quarter of individuals when they present with, the first present with the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, have a severe uh, cognitive impairment. The flavor of that cognitive impairment is different than Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's less amnestic and more disexecutive. Um, and by the, by the time someone's had Parkinson's disease for 10 years, the motor symptoms for 10 years, the vast majority, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent, have severe cognitive impairment. Uh, so it's not inevitable that individuals with Parkinson's disease have cognitive impairment, but it's very common. And we wanted to understand, is the genetic risk for that cognitive impairment the same or different than the genetic risk for the motor aspects of the disease? So we did this as a, a, a largely as a through a consortium of, of Udall centers. So again, thank you to the people in the audience who have uh, contributed. So I'll review uh, the work of about the last eight years around this. Uh, first. Um, in this table. So um, uh, each row is a, a gene that has been genetic variant in a gene or, an, or a specific allele like APOE, the APOE4. These have been uh, um, uh, reproducibly shown to uh, affect the um, motor risk of Parkinson's disease, and the exception there would be APOE4. So let me run through this for you. And then the, the risk is either for PD, meaning PD motor, or PDD, meaning Parkinson's disease with dementia. So it's easiest to start with alpha-synuclein. So variance in alpha-synuclein, or even triplication in alpha-synuclein, has been replicated many times as a, a risk for a PD motor. It, if you have Parkinson's disease, right, so now we're asking not the whole population, now just people have Parkinson's disease, what's the likelihood that you'll develop dementia? And that those variants and alpha-synuclein have no effect on your risk for cognitive impairment. Uh, uh, John mentioned uh, the uh, MAPT haplotype. Uh, the MAPT haplotype, uh, again, reproducibly uh, shown to increase the risk of PD motor. No effect on your risk for cognitive impairment or dementia in PD. APOE, uh, despite um, some early work that hinted at a relationship of APOE4, inheritance of APOE4 and PD motor, that has not been replicated by us or others. So I have it here as a, a dash, and I think, I think the majority of the field now accepts that those initial smaller studies uh, were underpowered. Uh, larger studies, including ours, have not been able to replicate this. So in inheritance of the uh, epsilon-4 allele of APOE is not related to your risk of PD motor. But if you have Parkinson's disease and you've inherited the epsilon-4 allele of APOE, your risk of um, uh, dementia uh, goes up substantially. The gene that encodes glucose rebrosidase is uh, among the most common risk factors for uh, PD motor. And if, you're, if you carry that genetic risk, your risk of dementia is also elevated and intensely interesting to us because we simply can't uh, think 
of an explanation for this yet. Uh, variants in the LARC2 gene known uh, to increase your risk of Parkinson's disease very strongly. Uh, if you have that variant of Parkinson's disease, your likelihood of dementia is actually low, it's decreased. We were interested in, uh, initially in those genetic variants that increase risk of PD dementia, so these are the two. Um, and I'm running short on time, so I'll just, these two graphs um, along the x-axis are the names of uh, neuropsychological tests. So they're the core neuropsychological test battery that we use, and the purpose of those two graphs is simply to show that if you have um, Parkinson's disease and you inherit APOE4, you're at risk for an amnestic form of cognitive impairment. And if you have Parkinson's disease from a GBA variant, you're at risk for the disexecutive uh, form of cognitive impairment in PD. So, the, so we've identified, using this candidate gene approach, uh, those, those that increase or decrease the risk of dementia in Parkinson's disease and its different, different types of cognitive impairment. So working towards this idea that we're identifying uh, clues to the specific molecular drivers. I'll show you one example of detecting uh, latent disease, and the idea here is that uh, early detection, the goal is to uh, maximize impa impact of disease modification when we have disease-modifying therapies and to uh, minimize iatrogenic injury. So um, uh, this is an example for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I can, I don't know if there are many neurologists in the audience because I can usually tell who the neurologists are when I show this graph because, um, uh, because of this. I took this off the web. This is demonstrating a lumbar tap and this is a very bad lumbar tap because the <laughs> syringe is full of red fluid. So it's, it's a bad day for everybody but the, the, these data come from uh, cerebral spinal fluid obtained from uh, the lumbar sac. So um, uh, data that we uh, initially published back in 2007, and I give another reference because it almost simultaneously, uh, but in truth, uh, three months before our paper came out, a paper from Wash U came out showing almost exactly the same thing. So there are these two facets of Alzheimer's disease, and we have two biomarkers that are now uh, relatively widely used in research settings and are uh, before the FDA for consideration uh, for um, uh, application in general medical practice, but we're not to that point yet, but, but used relatively widely in research settings. So just like we have plaques and tangles in CSF, we have the major protein of, one of the major proteins in plaques is A-beta-42, and that's on the x-axis, and then one of the phosphoisoforms of tau is on the y-axis, the P uh, P181 tau. Um, so there are four uh, colored, color-coded groups here. Uh, We'll go, we'll go with the two extremes first. So control individuals, meaning uh, people went through literally a whole day of neuropsychological testing and are cognitively normal. Right? These are volunteers. We're, we're far away from population-based studies now. They research volunteers. So uh, exhaustive testing that they are cognitively normal. Uh, medically, they are healthy and they're less than or equal to 50 years of age. And that's an arbitrary cutoff, but we we proposed that uh, latent Alzheimer's disease, we know latent Alzheimer's disease is out there from the autopsy record, was that latent Alzheimer's disease is gonna be uncommon in people in their 30s and 40s. So those are the black circles, and uh, that's the distribution of, that's the scatter plot for their A-beta-42 and P181 tau and CSF. And so uh, you can see there's a, there's a distribution for A-beta, um, uh, but the tau levels are, you know, uh, stay quite low. Then look at individuals who have Alzheimer's disease dementia. So what happens is that A-beta-42 levels in CSF drop. Those are the red circles. They go down, and there's pretty good, I think, <coughs> excuse me, uh, neuroimaging data to say that that is associated with deposition of A-beta peptides in brain, and P181 and other forms of tau increase in CSF. So you have the switch. This is um, CSF for these two proteins in the absence of Alzheimer's disease, in the presence of extensive Alzheimer's disease. 
MCI is an intermediate category. These are, I mentioned very early on when I was showing the self-portraits, these are people that are thought to have um, uh, prodromal uh, Alzheimer's disease. They have difficulties most commonly with memory, but yet they're still able to function. Uh, um, they're sort of in between. There is some, there little overlap with the controls, some overlap with more advanced AD. They're sort of in between. And what's compelling about this graph, I think, uh, are the controls that are greater than 50 years of age. Most of them look like the younger controls, right? This individual, in fact, this um, uh, woman is 101 years old when she volunteered to give spinal fluid, so very, very, right? She has a CSF of a 20-year-old. Uh, but there are green circles over here overlapping advanced Alzheimer's disease, we followed these people for uh, quite a long time, uh, uh, but within five years, all of those individuals had converted either uh, to MCI or dementia. So we uh, detected, uh, we and our colleagues at WashU, what was for the first time evidence of latent Alzheimer's disease. Right? So the, these proteins change in CSF, and subsequently the disease is expressed somewhere on a period of around five years later. There are other tools like PET imaging tools. Um, the last part of this idea of precision health or precision medicine, we're able to stratify people by risk and with genetics, we think that's giving us insight into molecular drivers. We need tools to detect latent disease. I showed you an example of one. There are others in imaging. There are other biochemical markers um, for Parkinson's disease. No one has yet been successful in uh, developing biochemical-based uh, biomarkers in uh, peripheral fluids, although there is truly a global effort uh, to do that. The last step in this cascade is ha to have disease-modifying individuals that are tailored to someone's uh, uh, molecular drivers of disease. And I'll just very briefly review some of the current efforts. So um, for individuals that appear to have uh, their Alzheimer's disease being uh, driven by inheritance of the Epsilon-4 allele. Uh, there was a lot of excitement about oh, th three or four th years ago around RXR agonists. Um, uh, uh, very exciting data at first, more mixed results now, uh, but still advancing to phase two clinical trial. There's the anti-amyloid uh, A4 uh, trial uh, being run by Risa and her colleagues at the Mass General. That's a passive A-beta immunization trial focused on individuals who have inherited the APOE4 allele. And then for uh, individuals that have inherited presenil-1 pre mutations, so autosomal dominant forms of Alzheimer's disease, uh, there's the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, which you may have read about in Medellin, Colombia, and then the DIAN trial being run out of Wash U. Um, I have run out of time, so I think I'll... I'll say one more thing and then stop. Uh, we already have disease-modifying therapies for this type of small vessel injury to brain. Uh, and I would caution you when you read uh, research articles that say this or that antihypertensive uh, treats Alzheimer's disease, I really doubt that's true. It's possible. I doubt it's true. I think what's happening is that that antihypertensive is limiting small vessel injury to brain and that it's improving cognitive health, but it's not really impacting Alzheimer's disease. So with that, I'll stop. I'll thank uh, the people who support us and thank you for your kind attention.